Okay, chapter two, verse 11 and 12. Peter tells these persecuted Christians in Asia Minor to live such good lives among the unbelievers that the unbelievers may be led to Christ by observing their good works so that they may become part of the chorus glorifying God when Christ returns to finalize history. Live such good lives that they may join the fellowship. They may convert and be part of that chorus glorifying God. And this good living that he's urging them to in verses 11 and 12, it includes submitting to various authorities. And then he runs through those. Everyone submit to governing authorities. uh, Slaves submit to masters. Wives submit to husbands. And that's in chapter 2, verse 13 through chapter 3, verse 6. And then having mentioned the role of wives, the responsibility of wives to submit to husbands, he then mentions the corresponding duty of husbands to wives. He then mentions the the corresponding duty of husbands to honor the wives in chapter 3, verse 7. Then then in chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, he explains that living differently from, yet attractively to, the hostile world, it involves not only submitting to proper authorities, but also living in love and harmony with one another and not repaying mistreatment by the world. So you have submitting, you have living in love and harmony with one another, not repaying mistreatment by the world. And then when we ended two weeks ago, we were looking at a lengthy section this chapter three, verse 13 through chapter four, verse six. And I read the whole thing. What I'm going to do now is just piecemeal. I'm going to read the first section. I already went through that. I'll say a little bit, repeat some of what I said, and then we'll pick back up with where we were in chapter three, verse 13. He says, Now, who is the one that will harm you if you are zealots of the good? Indeed, even if you should suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. So do not fear the fear of them or fear their fear, nor be troubled. But in your heart, sanctify the Christ as Lord, being always ready to give a defense to anyone who demands an accounting for the hope in you. But do so with gentleness and fear, having a clear conscience in order that when when you are spoken against, Those reviling your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing good if the will of God wills than for doing evil. Now, as I said a couple of weeks ago, Peter tells him in chapter three, verses 13 and 14, that men, human beings cannot harm faithful Christians in any ultimate sense, in any sense that ultimately matters. Can they harm you? Of course they can harm you. I mean, you know. They were being persecuted, but not in any sense that ultimately matters. And the parallel was in Romans chapter eight that we looked at. So he tells them that men cannot harm faithful Christians in any ultimate sense, a sense that ultimately matters. And because of that, he commands them not to fear their threats or intimidation. Okay, they ultimately can't touch you. So don't kowtow to them. Don't allow them to threaten you so as to abandon your faith and your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Rather than being bullied from faithfulness to God, which the world is always trying to do, they're to reaffirm in their hearts their commitment to Jesus as Lord. That's what he's talking about here. You see, you set a Christ, you set apart Lord. Do not fear their fear, but in your heart sanctify the Christ as Lord. Don't be pushed from the faith. But renew your dedication to Jesus Christ as Lord of all. So he's telling them, he tells them to do that. And then in, related to that in chapter 3, verse 15, he tells them that they're always to be ready to give a defense to anyone who demands an accounting for the hope that is in them or among them. And then in 16, he says they're to do so with gentleness. Okay, we're commanded to be gentle as we're doing that, as we're explaining. Why do you live the way you do when it's upsetting people? Why do you live? Why are you out of step with the culture? Well, you give a defense for that. You explain why we do that. What is the basis of our hope? Why do we believe the gospel? Why do we believe the truth of God and, the, and of who Jesus Christ is? So he tells them that they're to be ready to do it. And in verse 17, he reinforces the call to keep their conduct good, to live with a clear conscience before God. He says they are to do so in verse 17 because for... It is better to suffer for doing good, to suffer persecution for behavior in accord with the Christian faith, which kind of suffering God, he says, if the will of God wills, God sometimes permits. Obviously, they're enduring it now. So God sometimes wills or permits that it's better to suffer for doing good than to suffer punishment for wrongdoing. Okay, we went through that and talked about that two weeks ago. Now, that brings us to where we stopped 
And that's chapter three, verses 18 to 22. Let me read that again and then we'll slog through this. OK, he says, because Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison when they formerly disobeyed, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. This water also as an antitype, that is, baptism, now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but a pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who, having gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers being subject to him. Okay, as I said two weeks ago, this is a notoriously difficult section. All right. It is it is a section that Martin Luther described as the most difficult passage in all the New Testament. All right. So uh, that is you have to tread with even greater humility and circumspection when when you have a text before you that has occupied some of the, you know, the greatest Christian thinkers for millennia. uh, You know, you're just going to bop in and go, you know, I'm the guy on the planet who knows the definitive answer. All right. I'm going to tell you how I understand this text. I am well aware of different views, different positions. I'm just going to tell you how I understand it. Well aware that you may disagree with me, and I just ask if you do, just don't gnash your teeth at me, okay? I'm going to, as I always do, I'm going to explain to you, this is how I see it, this is why I see it. I give that to you if you disagree. You sit here and go, okay, I heard what he's saying, I think it's junk. Okay, this is what has persuaded me, and I've wrestled with it for quite a bit, but so have many others who would disagree with me. All right, now, as I understand the first part here of verse 18, Peter's saying that it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, because in the former case, one's following the path of Christ. Okay, it's better to suffer for doing good than suffer for doing evil, because in that case, you're following the path of Christ, who, though being absolutely righteous, right? I mean, he's sinless. He is perfectly righteous and sinless. He also suffered once for all time in accordance with God's will, in accordance with God's purpose, that he atoned for sin so as to bring the unrighteous, including them, to God. So when you're suffering for faithfulness, for righteousness, it's better to do that because then you're walking in the path of Christ who also suffered though being righteous, according to the will of God, that he would atone for sins and bring human beings to God. Peter David's remarks, he says, Jesus died in order that, so to speak, he might reach across the gulf between God and humanity and taking our hand, lead us across the territory of the enemy into the presence of the father who called us. So this is this idea that according to God's purpose and will, it's better to suffer for righteousness than to be punished for wrongdoing, because in that Act, you are following in the path of Christ. Now, there are the there are two passive, these passive participles here where he says, having been put to death, but made alive. OK, that seems clearly to refer to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Having been put to death, he's talking about Christ and he says, having been put to death, made alive, seems clear. He's talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, that then raises the question of how do you understand then these two nouns that follow those participles, having been put to death flesh, but made alive spirit. Okay, how do you understand those and therefore how do you translate those? Those two, uh, those two nouns that modify those two participles. All right, now, rather than give you all the various options, I'm just going to tell you that I agree with Paul Actemeyer in his commentary in the Hermeneia series, his commentary on First Peter, that the most natural way to understand these nouns are, I, I got to get into the weeds just a bit, but the, the nouns are in the dative case, it's called. English, you know, he, Greek is an inflected language. All right, so we have, you have nouns. In English, the way we know that how nouns function is typically their order in the sentence. Like Steve threw John's ball to Dave. Okay, we have it, we either do it by the order, by prepositions, or by uh, apostrophes that show possession. But that's not how Greek works. Greek doesn't do it on the order of the words. It does it on it's an inflected language. So how the noun functions has a different ending, a different form to the word. So you can tell the case. How is it functioning? 
Well, these two nouns are in what's called the dative case. But the problem is, is dative case, like many of the cases, it has a range of meanings. Its typical meaning is as an indirect object to, but it also can mean by, for, with, or in. Okay, so you have to say, well, how do you understand it here? And with Actemeyer, what I think is the most, is, is the clearest, the most reasonable understanding when he says, having been put to death flesh, but made alive spirit, I think it makes the most sense to take this dative noun spirit in an instrumental sense. Okay, so that you translate it and understand it. I mean, he was put to death flesh, but made alive by the spirit. He was made alive by the Holy Spirit. It's translated that way in the King James, the New King James and the NIV. Okay, so I just tell you that nothing that I'm telling you is is, uh, you know, crazy. You have to be careful. You see, when you got somebody up here teaching and he's saying this kind of stuff. But, you know, it's you can see it like, you know, the scholars who translated King James, New King James, NIV, that's how they took it. OK, and I think that's the most sensible meaning As Actemeyer notes. He says it's a central affirmation of the New Testament that Christ was raised to life by God. You can see that in a number of places. He cites Acts chapter three, verse 15, chapter four, verse 10, Romans chapter 10, verse nine, first Corinthians six, 14, Galatians one, one, first Thessalonians one, ten. So it just makes sense to me, knowing this central affirmation of the New Testament, that Christ was raised to life by God, to take this as an instrumental sense to say that having been put to death flesh, but made alive by the spirit. Now, beyond the fact that the New Testament has this as a central affirmation that God raised Christ, you see hints that that the agent or means by which God raised Christ from the dead was the Holy Spirit. And I think you can see that it's implied, at least, in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. You get this suggestion here, this indication, this implication that God, yes, God raised Jesus from the dead, but the means or agent by which God did that was the Holy Spirit. So that all kind of strengthens my conviction that the right way of taking this is an instrumental sense. Having been put to death flesh, but made alive by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was God's agent in raising Jesus. Okay. Now, why don't most of the translations go that way? I've got, you know, King James, New King James, NIV go that way. Most translators resist that because you have two parallel phrases here. Put to death flesh, but made alive spirit. So typically you would say, if you're going to take this dative noun as an instrumental then you should also take the other as an instrumental. And they find it unsatisfying to say he was put to death by flesh. They say that just doesn't really sound right. Okay, so that steers them away from what I'm telling you. All right. Now, I think you can take it that way. In fact, Actemeyer takes it that way. So you could say put to death by the flesh, meaning by sinful humanity and raised by the spirit. But I also think you don't have to slavishly follow this idea that because you have a parallel clauses that you must translate the two datives in the same way, you must construe them in the same way. You know, I think that, you know, you, you have examples, for, for example, the King James, New King James and NIV, they didn't translate in the same way. So that's a clue to you that it's not an ironclad rule that somehow Greek grammar forbids you from doing this. It's a, you know, it's a thing that would be normal for you to do that, but it's not something that's ironclad. And you can also see that because there are, there are a couple of verses where you have parallel prepositional phrases that commonly are translated differently. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 6.11 and 1 Timothy 3.16. Okay, so Peter could be saying, and I think he is saying, that Christ was killed in the flesh, meaning in his body or in his state of mortality, but was raised by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. And this possibility, it's enhanced, it's made even more likely if you say, look, it's possible here that this is part of a Christian hymn. Okay, that's a possibility. Now, if that's true, then you have even more grammatical license, even more room to break the parallelism, because poetry is full of poetic license, okay? So I'm not stuck on this idea, neither is Thomas Schreiner, a number of people. I translate it and understand that he's put to death in the body or in his state of mortality, but he was raised by the Holy Spirit. 
And as I said, you could still maintain the parallelism if you said put to death as Akdamar does, put to death by the flesh, meaning by sinful humanity. That's who killed him. Unbelieving humanity and raised by the spirit. I'm not going to go into this, but I also think you can get to the same point if you take them as datives of sphere. But that's a rabbit I'm just not going to mess with. Okay, I'm not. You, I think you could do it. You get to basically the same thing. All right. So how do I understand this? I think that the, he's saying that the spirit who raised Jesus, if I'm right here, you see, he says, having been put to death by the flesh, but made alive by the spirit, by whom? OK, now this is another one of these things. You simply have a preposition and you have a relative pronoun. What's it referring to? You can you can translate it in which, which many people do. They take it as in which and they take it to mean in his resurrected state. Ah, well, now if we're talking about then we're talking post resurrection. OK, I'm taking it to be by or through whom, which is perfectly permissible by the spirit. Right there, then we have this this uh, a phrase that modifies the spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So I'm thinking that what he's saying is, is that the spirit who raised Jesus to life is the same spirit by whom Christ went and preached in the person of Noah. Now, he doesn't specify that. I'm going to talk about why he wouldn't need to specify understood Christ through the spirit in the person of Noah understood Christ, through the Spirit, went and preached to the people who were disobedient in the days when Noah was building the ark. People who thereafter died in the flood. So Christ, through the Spirit, in the person of Noah, is preaching to the people who were disobedient in the days when Noah was building the ark, who then died in the flood and who have since that time been imprisoned in Hades awaiting the final judgment. Now, if that strikes you, you might be going, boy, that seems like a kind of strange idea. All right. This interpretation that I'm offering to you is at least as old as Augustine. Okay, late 300s, early 400s. It may be older than that, but we can document it at least as old as Augustine. And it was the dominant view in Christianity for well over a thousand years. All right. So so it's not, you know, it's something well known, has deep roots. But today it is a minority view. All right. Today it's held by only a minority of scholars, a minority of scholars What's some notable people? You know, there's Wayne Grudem and, and uh, Millard Erickson and John Feinberg and Edmund Clowney. There's a number of them. But most people today would reject this view. But that's OK. It makes the most sense to me. I'm explaining to you what I think. But I alert you to the fact most scholars today would reject what I'm telling. You. OK, but there's a, a significant minority anyway that, would, that still defends this view. Now, the notion of Christ preaching through Noah By means of the spirit, you say that seems really odd, but it's not as strange as it may sound, especially given what Peter said in in chapter one, verses 10 and 11, where he said that the spirit of Christ spoke through the Old Testament prophets. So we already have Peter giving some indication of an identity of Christ in the spirit, the spirit of Christ speaking through the Old Testament prophets. And in second Peter, chapter two, verse five, he describes Noah as what a preacher of righteousness. So here he sits here and he says, uh, and preached to the spirits in prison. And in Second Peter 2, 5, he refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness, which is a cognate form of the word that's used here. So it's not that, you know, it, it may seem, you, stri- you see it and you say, that seems odd. But there are some hints, I think, that, that, that that's pointing in the right direction. Now, many people, they look at the word and they say, wait a minute, spirits, when you say spirits in prison, you're understanding that to mean the spirits of human beings. And they say, well, that, you know, that's really probably not right, because spirit commonly refers to an angel or a demon. And that's true. It commonly does. But it also can refer to the spirits of human beings. And you can see that in Numbers 16, 22, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Of course, you have to be looking in the Septuagint to see that Greek word. Uh, Matthew 27, 50, Acts 7, 59, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. And most notably, perhaps, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. So you can see that the word spirit can refer to human spirits, does sometimes, I think it is here in this case. Now, when it says that when Peter says that Christ preached to the spirits in prison, he need not mean, and I don't think he does mean, that that they were spirits in prison when Christ preached to them. 
Okay, I don't think he's he's saying that, that they were spirits in prison when Christ preached them. He could mean, and I think he does mean, that they now are spirits in prison. At the time, he's writing to them, but when Christ preached to them, they were human beings, beings of both body and spirit living on the earth. So he preached to them through the spirit in the person of Noah when they were human beings. They died in the flood, and since that time, they have been spirits in Hades. They have been spirits imprisoned in the realm of the dead since that time. I don't think, in fact, the New American Standard and the New American Standard updated, both of those insert the word now to reflect that understanding. They'll put here, it says, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits. The New American Standard says now in prison. Okay, why is it? Why does it do that? It does that to reflect this understanding that though they're now in prison, they were not spirits in prison when he preached and they were human beings. Since then, they have died and their spirits have been imprisoned in Hades. Okay, so I think that's that's right. And you say, well, that just seems kind of strange. But that's how most commentators, by the way, there's an analogous uh, uh, situation in chapter four, verse six. That's how most commentators, the majority in this case, understand first Peter four, six. The gospel was preached to those who are now dead. Okay, almost everybody's on board with that. He just says the gospel preached to those who are dead. They they understand that he's saying the gospel is preached to those who are now dead, now dead at the time of the letter, though they were alive on earth when the gospel was preached to them. Okay, and you see that, for instance, in First Peter four six, the NIV, the TNIV, and the New English translation, they all three insert the word now to make that understanding clear. So this is what I I, I think he's saying. That listen, you had you had. Through the spirit and the person of Noah, he went and preached to these people who were rebellious and ungodly, preaching repentance and faith. And then you had the flood. And since that time, they have they are now spirits in prison. Now, that the, that the spirits in prison are the spirits of humans who were living on earth in the days of Noah is indicated in my judgment by the specification that the preaching took place in an earlier time. Okay, he says in verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits and for when they formerly disobeyed, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah. Okay, I think that's the right way to understand that. Now, let me say a bit about this. See, some getting into the weeds is unavoidable here. Okay, Uh, sorry, but I have to. Most translations understand there is another there is another participle here disobeyed. And most translations understand that participle disobey here where he says uh, when the patience of God, when they formerly disobeyed is how I've translated. it. Most translations take that participle in an adjectival sense. In other words, they take it as an adjective modifying spirits. And so it, you wind up typically in translations. It says who formerly disobeyed. Well, who's not in the text? That reflects an understanding of how you're going to translate this participle. Okay? But the rules of Greek grammar strongly favor taking this participle in an adverbial sense, modifying the preaching. And if you take that then in a temporal sense, adverbially, in a temporal sense, what does it produce? It produces when they formerly disobeyed. Okay, if Peter had wanted to use it adjectivally, according to normal rules of Greek grammar, he would have put an article in front of it. Okay, he didn't do that. And so I think it's better to take it adverbially and then to take it temporally here. And if you look in the English Standard Version, for example, the English Standard Version, I think, takes it causally and says because they formally disobeyed. But there's a footnote. It says or when. And in the New English translation, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the New English translation, a guy named Daniel Wallace is heavily involved in the New English translation. He may have done all of it for for all I know. But Wallace is a very well-known Greek grammarian. He's written the grammar that's probably the best used. It's called Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics. And one of the notes of of the New English translation, the note there, it says, the grammatical construction strongly favors an adverbial interpretation describing the time of the preaching. Wayne Grudem, in his commentary on on, uh, 1 Peter, he spends three pages going through this. Okay, so I'm on good, solid, grammatical ground in taking this adverbially instead of adjectivally, as the footnote in the ESV indicates. 
So I think he's saying when they formally disobeyed, and then he, he elaborates on that. He specifies that. When they formally disobeyed, that is, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. That's when this preaching took place. That's when it occurred. Now, there are many, uh, many texts in extra biblical Jewish literature. Okay, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of literature, Jewish writing that's not Bible. Okay, and there are many texts in extra biblical Jewish literature that interpreted the phrase sons of God in Genesis chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 4 as referring to sinful angels who married human women. Okay, and this influences a lot of the interpretations of this text. Now, there are a lot of extra biblical Jewish writings that interpreted sons of God that way as sinful angels who married human women. But there were only a few extra biblical Jewish texts that put this assumed angelic sin at the time of the flood. Most of them put the put this assumed angelic sin two to four generations before the flood. So, see, I'm thinking he's talking about the spirits of human beings. People say, no, no, he's talking about these spirits here. But I said, well, you know, if you look at the extra biblical Jewish literature that you're appealing to, they put that typically, almost always, two to four generations before the flood. And he specifies here that this preaching took place at the time Noah's building the ark. So I said, I, I, I'm not really persuaded by that and convinced by that. Now, on the other hand, the biblical evidence is clear that there were human beings disobeying God. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark. I mean, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 13, it's all about human sin as the reason for the flood, right? I mean, humans going crazy, violence going crazy. Slaughter and killing and all this kind of thing. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, he identifies Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And then he describes the worlds of Noah's day as what? A world of the ungodly. Okay, so I know that I've got human beings rebelling and sinning and this kind of thing. So I'm thinking he's talking about uh, preaching to the to the people who were there. Now, outside of Scripture, some extra biblical Jewish literature, there's there's a writing called the Sibylline Oracles, which was written uh, in the first last part of the first century B.C. to the first part of the first century A.D. Okay, late first century B.C. or early first century A.D. It's written now. It describes Noah as exhorting the people to repentance and they're mocking of him. OK, so he's known to be a preacher of righteousness. Peter picks that up when he calls him a preacher of righteousness. But he was known to be that through other Jewish writings. He's preaching and appealing to people. And what are they doing? They're mocking him. You have rabbinic writings that are a bit later, but they may reflect writings and thoughts of the first century. Same thing. You have Noah represented there as as preaching. Uh, he, he describes him there as warning people while building the ark and being mocked and despised. Clement of Rome, who's a first century, late first century Christian writer. He wrote that Noah preached repentance. So we have this idea in the stream of thought, this understanding of Noah as somebody who's out preaching repentance and faith, which Peter seems to put his imprimatur on in Second Peter when he calls him a preacher of righteousness. So he puts God's stamp of approval that that tradition was in fact true. And so you have these examples here. And we have that in other Jewish literature frequently mentions human sin as the reason for God bringing the flood. All right. Why did I go through that? So in my view, that even if, even if Peter's readers, even if you grant that his readers believed that Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 4 referred to fallen angels who took human wives, which was a popular but not uniform understanding in first century Judaism. That was a popular view, but it wasn't a uniform view. But even if they accepted that view, okay, it still seems likely that Peter is here speaking of humans who disobeyed during the building of the ark. Rather than Christ speaking to angels or demons, making some proclamation to them, it still seems likely to me, even if they thought that's what Genesis 6, 2 and 4 meant, that here Peter is saying that Christ, by the Spirit, in the person of Noah, was working to call these people to faith and repentance in the time Noah was building the ark. Okay, I think that's, I think that's what he's talking about. Now, this is, it seems, further supported to me by the fact these spirits are said to have disobeyed when? When the patience of God waited. Almost certainly means 
when the patience of God waited for repentance. Okay, well, that strongly suggests that he's talking about human spirits because there's no indication anywhere of demons or fallen spirits having the ability or opportunity to repent. So I clearly know that that to me is something that is is strongly supportive. Indeed, there are a number of extra biblical Jewish writings, including Philo, who Philo writes at the very beginning of the first century A.D. He lives from, say, 20 B.C. to A.D. 50. The Jewish writer Philo, he's from Alexandria, writes in Greek. His writings, they specifically connect God's patience in the years leading up to the flood with his waiting for sinful humans to repent. Okay, so you have all of this that seems to feed into this idea that he's talking about appealing to these people then. And you say, well, all right, look, why does Peter put it this way? I mean, why does Peter, why does he say this? Why doesn't he simply say that Christ preached through Noah to the spirits? Why does he say he preached through or by the spirit with it being understood it was in the person of Noah? Well, let me read to you what Grudem says, and then uh, we'll just say a few more things about this, and then we'll move on. But he says here, Grudem says, the abundance of extra biblical testimony to Noah's preaching to rebellious unbelievers during the building of the ark would have made the sense proposed here much more readily understood. In fact, if we could have asked any first century Jew or Christian the question, who preached to those who disobeyed in the days of Noah while the patience of God was waiting during the building of the ark, there would certainly be only one answer. It was Noah who did this preaching to a group of Christians who had such an understanding of the biblical narrative. Peter then wrote that Christ preached to the disobedient people in Noah's time. It might not have been asking too much of his readers to expect them to realize that he meant that it was through Noah by means of the spirit, that it was through Noah that Christ did this preaching. In short, the sentence may not have been as obscure to the original readers as it has long seemed to subsequent interpreters. Okay, so I offer this idea. Now, I think the remarks you say, well, why is he, why would he be saying this? Why in the world would he be launching off into this idea of Christ preaching by the Spirit in the person of Noah to the people who were rebellious in Noah's day? I think what he's doing, I think these remarks, they serve to remind Peter's readers that Christ is through the Spirit, working in them and with them toward the goal of appealing as a small minority to an ungodly and hostile world. The very thing he's been telling them to do. What's he been telling them? Live such good lives, what? That you might draw them. You know, always be prepared to give a defense. Why? You might draw them. You are a small persecuted minority in an ungodly sea. And he tells them, look, you're not the lone ranger. That was Noah and his people. Noah was out here appealing to the unrighteous, the ungodly, and God, Christ, was at work through the Spirit in Noah. He's at work through the Spirit in you in making this appeal, and God waited patiently for the repentance of the ungodly in Noah's time. He's waiting patiently for the repentance of the ungodly in your time and in our time. But whenever God chooses to bring the flood of judgment, no, dear faithful ones, Whenever he chooses to bring the flood of judgment, know that you will pass safely through that frightening event. I am calling you as a small persecuted minority to appeal to this ungodly world. Know that Christ is in you and with you. And also know that when God chooses to bring that flood of judgment, you, the faithful, will pass safely through it. I think that's what he's doing. Okay, but as I say, I again tell you, this text is notoriously difficult. All right, but there you have my shot at it. Now, in Noah's day, the eight, faith, eight faithful souls were saved from judgment, he says, through water. All right, you didn't have this question of how do you understand this preposition, dia? Because they have ranges of meaning. See, so you say, how do you understand this preposition? Okay, he says here they're saved from judgment through water. I think he means in the sense that water which served as the means of the world's judgment, also served as the means of their deliverance. He saved them through water. He saved them by means of water. It was water that lifted the ark and protected its occupants from the water, the occupants from the water's deadly effects. So it was the means of judgment 
but it was also water's nature that lifted the ark and kept them safe. I think that's what he's talking about. Let me read to you what J. Ramsey Michael says in his commentary on the word biblical. He says, the likely meaning is that Noah and his family were brought safely through the flood by means of the flood waters themselves. That's the understanding I'm proposing to you. He says, see, the Apuras by fire, meaning take it, taking it in that same sense. The preposition in that same sense is in one, chapter 1, verse 7. If it is objected that they, that they escaped only because Noah built an ark that would float, the appropriate and only possible answer is that Peter is interested in water in the story, not wood, because there's something he wants to say about Christian baptism. That's how I see it. I think he's characterizing it this way and he's saying they were saved through water by means of water. Water was the instrument of their deliverance in that it lifted them from the flood's destroying effects. You see, that seems like kind of an odd way. I think he puts it that way because he has something to say about Christian baptism. And I know he's saying something about Christian baptism. He says that the saving water of the flood, he says it's, it is a type. It is a foreshadow. It is a symbol of something else. The saving water of the flood is a type. The antitype of which, the reality that corresponds to that foreshadowing, the reality, the substance of that symbol is Christian baptism that now saves you. You see, it, it, he says, so here you have this flood water. You're delivered by means of this flood water which is the type, the antitype of which, the fulfillment of which is Christian baptism that now saves them and, of course, saves us. Okay, then he adds that the saving effect of baptism, it's, it's related not to some physical effect of the water. You know, people in churches of Christ sometimes get accused, accused this may be passe, but we get accused, at least in, in history, of being water gospelers. Thinking that there's somehow that, you know, that, that that's what saves you. That's the means of atonement and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's just crazy. You see, he adds here that the saving effect of baptism is related not to some physical effect of the, the water, the removal of dirt from the flesh, but to the fact that baptism, see, being immersed in penitent faith in, in the name of Christ, it's either an appeal to God for a good conscience or it's a pledge to God to maintain a good conscience. Okay, how to understand the difference between appeal and pledge on this word epirotema is just very difficult to decide. Half the translations take it as appeal, the other half take it as pledge. Okay, and there are reasons because it's just hard to be sure what sense is conveyed here. But either way, you have it, see, it's an expression of the human heart directed to God. It's not, it, we are involved in it. It's an expression of the human heart directed to God. And then he declares the objective basis on which Christian baptism saves. How does it save? How does it deliver you? Is it because there's something in the water? No. You see, the objective basis he gives you here is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why, you see, it is, in other words, the expression of faith in baptism is related to salvation only because of Christ's atoning work represented by his resurrection, as it was in chapter one, verse three, only because his atoning work has made salvation impossible. Do you think if there was no cross that baptism would mean anything? Of course it wouldn't. It is only because of his atoning work, you see, that there is anything to being baptized. We are saved through Christ's atoning work. Baptism merely is the God ordained way. In which faith is to express itself for one to appropriate personally Christ's saving work. That is how we get into Christ. It is the culminating expression of saving faith. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 6 verse 3, he speaks of it as what? A baptism into Christ's death. Into his atoning death. I'm baptized into that. You see, now we have, you know, I, I think my sense judgment is is a lot of people in churches of Christ think that we're on weak ground when we talk about baptism as part of conversion. Baptism is the, is the moment of the transaction when faith appropriates the gift. This was understood. It's all over the New Testament. This was understood 
everywhere. It was understood for 1,500 years. I have a paper on the website called Some Thoughts on Christian Baptism. You can go look. <laughs> you know, many, many people. The first treatise done was Tertullian's treatise in the, in the late second century on uh, on baptism. And I can't quote it exactly, but he's got some heretic coming here saying that you didn't need to be baptized. And he's all over it. Says this person, yeah, you know, just like ASP, hanging out, ASP, hanging out in the uh, desert areas. They know how to kill little fishes by taking them out of water. You see? And so this idea is not new. And then, then, then when you get to the Protestant Reformation, Zwingli decided that this was somehow some bad work and that's had influences since then. But Martin Luther, you know, people accuse Martin Luther, say, listen, Luther, your view that baptism is essential and that's the moment of grace. Of course, they'd be baptizing children, but that doesn't take away from their understanding that baptism is the point of transaction. You see, he said, Luther, look, you know, that, that makes you vulnerable to the idea that you're into work salvation. And Luther's remark was, well, it is a work, but it's a work of God. You see, so this idea that this is somehow odd is just crazy. OK, you look at the Bible. It's clear. It's clear in Peter. It's clear in many places. But it is not that this is something about the water. It is simply the God ordained way of calling out for the blessing. Whether it's an appeal, whether it's a pledge, God has said, in penitent faith in Christ, I call you to submit to Christian baptism. And in that submission and expression of faith, your sins are forgiven and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is the truth. This isn't some idiosyncratic Church of Christ doctrine. This is biblical truth. Okay, stand on it, preach it, teach it. It's true. And I've done before a whole class on that, and maybe someday I'll do that again. I'll torture you with that. Okay, I I wanted to get further, but you know how that is. Uh, We'll just keep going in uh, next week. But let me, uh, Lord willing. Here's the next section. I'll read it in the bell ring. It says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you also must arm yourselves with the same resolve. For he who suffered in the flesh is finished with sin, so as to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For enough time has passed to have participated in the desire of the Gentiles, having traveled in licentiousness, lust, instances of drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and detestable acts of idolatry. See, we think, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll is something new. (laughs) There's nothing new under the sun, all right? Uh, They were partying down. He says, regarding which they are surprised by your not running with them into the same flood of debauchery, vilifying you. They will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For to this end, the gospel also was preached to the dead. NIV, TNIV, NET would insert to the now dead. And I think that's the right understanding. But since the word's not there, I didn't put it in there. I said, they will give an account of him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. To this end, the gospel is preached to the dead, that they may be judged in the flesh according to men, but live by the spirit according to God. We'll tackle that chapter four. Uh, There's some wrinkles in there. Thank you for coming.